Greetings, HD students, and here we go. We're jumping into our last segment or area of development, which is late adulthood. So let's start talking about what changes are going on or how we're developing as we get to be 65 or over. One of the things that this age group really does struggle with is discrimination. So ageism is prejudice in which people are basically judged according to their age, or it could be according to how old I think you are. So as we mentioned last time, you know, the skin is a telltale of our age, and sometimes we look older than we are, or we look younger than we are. And that can definitely affect that ageism or discrimination that we get based completely on age. I encourage you to take a moment to watch the YouTube video. I've included the link at the bottom of this slide, and it's just a really nice perspectives shared from the point of view of those who are in this elderly category and who kind of encountered or faced some of that ageism. All right, so Mark Twain said, age is an issue of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. And this is easier said than done, However, I think it's a really healthy perspective. As I've shared, I've studied gerontology in my education. I enjoy working with the elderly population. I am over 50 myself and aging happens. It just happens. These changes are gonna to happen to us. And um, my point of view is to enjoy life, be as young as you can by being healthy, right? So the fact that I can at my age go zip lining with my kids or do other fun activities is just to me a part of being young in the mind or young in your heart and enjoying life. So aging is not a bad thing, despite what our society at large tells us. We really don't value our elderly, we value youth, and I think that's something I'd like to change. All right, so again, with that ageism, with this discrimination, you know, there's many forms of discrimination, but when we really discriminate against people based solely on the fact that they are over 65 or that they are a certain age. What happens is it makes them feel, makes all of us feel, very small, right? It erodes our self-confidence, our self-esteem, our ability to think we're good at things or we're competent. That's what the word competent means. Competent means that we can handle things, we can do things. And when people kind of make fun of us or discriminate against us, then they're really saying we can't do those things. And so it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel valued in society. You don't feel honored for sure. And we can, as caregivers, also be a part of that issue. For instance, if you have, if you are taking care of your grandmother and um, you are her caregiver, and so your grandmother maybe can't walk or can't use her legs or get around very well, but her mind is sharp. And if you as the caregiver say, okay, this is what we're having for breakfast, this is what we're having for lunch, this is what we're doing for dinner, and you make all of the decisions, what happens is your grandmother's mind is still sharp. She may wanna say that she wants something else for lunch, or she may just wanna have some input into the decision making. In other words, yes, my legs don't work, but my mind works, and so I wanna be heard. I want to be valued. And so, again, the caregiver doesn't mean to diminish those feelings of independence because the caregiver thinks, I want to do as much as I can for my loved one, right? I want to help them as much as possible. But what I would say is allow them to make some decisions on their own. Uh, for instance, I used to work in radiology at Stanford Hospital. And I would have the radiologist tell me that, you know, when a patient would come in for a CAT scan or an MRI uh, exam or something where they need to actually lay down on the table to go into the tube, and the patient was in a wheelchair, that the technician would always ask the patient, how would you like to get from your chair to the exam table? Would you like for me to carry you? Would you like for me to push your chair next to the exam table? And the patient can then answer and say, yes, I will need you to transport me over to the exam table. Or they might say, if you just wheel my chair over next to the exam table, I can self-transfer. 
Right? But you're allowing the patient to have the voice to say what they would like to happen. So that's what we're talking about here. All right, so all isms are not a good thing, right? Sexism, racism, classism, ableism, which is discrimination against those who um, have disabilities, right? So all of those isms, if you will, are not a good thing, right? Um, however, ageism is really destructive because this group of individuals is already dealing with maybe a diminished sense of accomplishment. In other words, maybe they can no longer work and they've retired and maybe they can no longer again get around can't drive they took away my driver's license well that's devastating right um so they're feeling all of these different emotions and so this ism is very very destructive all right elder speak what is elder speak elder speak is sometimes when we talk to an older individual and we talk almost like in what i think of as baby language so an example might be if i met an individual and I said to them hello my name is Melinda what is your name that would be elder speak it's you know we're talking in these very short almost baby elementary type sentences we're yelling and you know it's kind of it's kind of demeaning meaning that it's kind of derogatory it doesn't feel good for the individual um, to have you talk to me like like my brain is completely gone or something and um, so that's what we don't want to do we don't want to speak to them in this elder speak conversation All right so we've got some real changes going on because of this older population so demography Demography is the study of population numbers. That's, you know, the official term, if you will. And what we're seeing is a huge shift in that kind of pyramid or that, that shape of what our population looks like. As we have more and more individuals, we're definitely looking today at more like, you know, 15 plus percent of our population is over the age of 65. And so we're getting more and more of our elders in this you know, in our Western or US society here. But look here, there used to be, so years ago, for every one senior or every one person over the age of 65, we had 20 kids under the age of 18, right? So that was kind of the ratio that we had. It was a 20 to one ratio. Now, most of our seniors, they don't, you know, how many of you, if I said to you, are you looking forward to getting old? Are you looking forward to moving into that long-term care facility? Don't you want to just love that smell, right? None of us really aspire to go live into a nursing home. Our seniors want to live with their spouse or live alone at home. Nobody really wants to move into the nursing home. That's not something that we look forward to. And so understand that we're going to see that, you know, that with that transition, if we have to move there, comes some challenges. So I mentioned earlier, we had a 20 to 1 ratio. Now, today, we have a 1 to 3 to 1 ratio, meaning for every senior over the age of 65, we only have three kids under the age of 18. By the year 2075, we will be at a one to one ratio, one to one. And that is because, again, our older population is living longer, right? Older population living longer, in addition to our families are having less kids. The years of my mom's generation, my mom has 12 siblings or 12 kids in her family. The years of having 12 kids are kind of gone. We don't have a lot of families, a minimal amount nowadays, that have 10 plus kids or even five plus kids. And so that dynamic is really changing what it looks like. So overall, the world is undergoing a shift, transition towards more older adults and fewer children. All right, so let's talk about kind of what it looks like to be in this age category. So what we call our young old, the majority of our older individuals are typically pretty healthy, right? <coughs> Excuse me, if they're not dealing with some chronic diseases, then they're healthy. 
<coughs> excuse me, our old, old is kind of in that middle. And this is the 75 to 85 year olds. And now at this point, we're starting to have some issues, whether that be physical issues, mental issues, or we're lonely. We've lost our partner. We, our friends have died off and, and we have some what we call social deficits. And then we get into that category of our oldest old, and these are individuals over the age of 85. And by now we're definitely looking at our individuals, most of them needing either to be transitioned to a home for the elderly or to have some in-home care. Right? because a lot of them will need different support and services. And we see our fastest growing age group is those that are living beyond 80, right? And again, medical interventions and technology has allowed us to extend life, but we may be living with chronic disease for that time. All right, sex, yes, sex in the 65 and over group can you believe it it still happens yes when i teach marriage and the family my students are like no no way what they have sex like once a month or like how often right <laughs> actually pretty active so we see here while sex is less frequent maybe the days of having five times a week type of thing is gone most couples say that their sex life improves rather than deteriorates as they age Right? So that's a positive thing. And again, we said before, usually when we're in a long-term relationship, a monogamous relationship, the sex is really good. All right, so some of the things that are changing, I mentioned before, driving. So our older adults, their reaction time is slower. Um, your vision is impaired. All of these are happening. And so we may lose our driver's license, which is really a loss of independence because now our senior is relying on Uber or relying on different forms of public transportation to get you to doctor's appointments or get you where you used to be able to run to the store before. Now you have to plan that activity, All right? So every one of our senses, our sight, our hearing, our smell, our sense of touch, all of these things will slow down, right? As, as we continue to get older, they're gonna slow down. Nearly all adults over the age of 65 will need eyeglasses, if you don't already, right? Um, for those of us such as myself who wear contacts or glasses in our younger years, definitely we can look at everybody joining the club as we get older, right? So these are some of the different impairments we go through with visual issues. The first one, cataracts. So a lot of our individuals get cataracts. This is really a thickening of the lens. And so what happens is things look really cloudy or blurry when we get cataracts. My mom has had cataracts in both her eyes and had surgery um, to correct them. Glycoma is this buildup of fluid um, in our eye, right? So it's a buildup of fluid, which is different than macular degeneration, which we typically associate with diabetes. And this was actually a impairment or deterioration of the retina, which is the center of the eye. So let's look at what they look like. So if we look at slide A, this is 2020 vision. This is for those who have awesome eyesight. If we look at slide B, we look at those who have cataracts. And we said before, it's a thickening of the lens which makes things look blurry, cloudy. If we look at slide C, these are individuals who have um, some glycoma which is that buildup of fluid. And here, what happens is the individual can see straight ahead, but they can't see what we call your peripheral vision, which is your side vision, which is opposite to slide D, which is individuals that have macular degeneration, which affects the black, the center of your eye, your retina. And so therefore, what happens is your center or your vision straight ahead is impaired, but you can see around you can see the peripheral vision. So we can expect to encounter some of these issues as we grow older. And again, definitely our seniors are wearing hearing aids, they're used, we're losing a lot of our auditory ability. Unfortunately, Medicare does not pay for hearing aids. Medicare is a health insurance for our seniors. So that's not good. All right, so primary and secondary aging, there's a difference. Both of them, contribute to making kind of slowing everything down or they contribute to make our major body systems less efficient. Primary aging is what happens to all of us. 
it is this universal change we're going to experience, right? Our heart is going to slow down. Our digestion is going to slow down. We can't process food as fast as we used to, right? Healing takes longer. So I remember one time my grandma cut herself, right? And I remember the, I came back to visit her weeks later and she still had that cut there. And I was thinking, man, it, grandma, it hasn't healed up yet. When we're younger, our, our white blood cells run over to that area that, of our body that's been invaded or, or damaged and they work very quickly to repair it. And as we age, that process takes longer. Secondary aging is different for all of us in the sense that secondary aging has to do with several different things. It has to do, number one, with you know, genetics. In other words, some of us are, are just going to age well. I'm kind of hoping that because my grandmother was 102 when she died that I've got good genes in my family. However, if I make some choices, which is poor health habits, in other words, if I start smoking you know, two packs a day, if I start drinking excessively, if I overconsume foods, especially my sugars and fats and all that, and if I never exercise, I can expect to die younger. I can. And so your secondary aging has to do with your genes and what we call lifestyle choices. Whether or not you choose to eat a good diet, whether or not you choose to exercise, those are lifestyle choices. And so those things can be different for all of us because we're making those decisions individually. All right, when it comes to flu season, there's two groups of people that when you hear that announcement that says it's time to get your flu shot, there's two groups of people that they say have priority of getting the flu vaccine. And that is your elderly and children. And they're priority for different reasons. Your elderly are priority for getting the flu shot because at this age, We've, they've lost a lot of the immunity that they had as children. When we get those shots and we, our body gets primed to fight against disease, as we get older, we lose that. And so in other words, the flu is going to hit us and affect our senior population much more dramatically than if you're 30 years old. The other group is your children. And the reason children get the flu shot first is because they have not been fully immunized. So they have not gotten all of the series of shots that we give up and through high school. And so therefore we need to make sure that they're protected, right? And hypertension, 30%, one in three of our adults today have high blood pressure, right? And remember, when you have high blood pressure, your body is working harder, your heart is pumping harder to get blood to the, all the cells of your body. And you know, therefore we're gonna look at heart disease and some other problems that will come with that. All right. So compression of morbidity really means that, you know what, gosh, some of us can be pretty healthy and pretty active, um, you know, before we get to that place where we're sick before we, we die. Look at this lady at 92. I hope I'm going to be able to be that flexible and stretch that well at that age. But understand the difference between chronic and acute illness. So chronic illness is something that is long term and that really does not have a cure per se. Acute illness can possibly be corrected or fixed or at least uh, repaired for the time being. So a heart attack is an example of acute illness because a patient comes into the ER with a heart attack or they have a heart attack and they drop, right? And hopefully we can revive them, we can get the heart going, and then, you know, they're okay. Well, okay and at that time. <laughs> Heart disease, though, may be the cause of the heart attack, and heart disease is something that we need to learn to manage. Heart disease does not go away. Heart disease is something we're going to live with. We're going to try to get it better in the sense of eating better. Exercising is a big one for heart disease, doing all of those different types of things. Falling. So our elders or our senior population is really at risk of falls. When we talk about osteoporosis, another term for osteoporosis is fragile bones. Because I mentioned to you before, when we're young, our bones are like this hard surface, right? They're, they're like just rock, calcified. As we age and we lose calcium, after the age of 35, we start to deplete or use up our calcium, our bones go from being solid to being like Swiss cheese. They get holes in it. They get fragile, they bend a little bit. And so because of that, our seniors are at risk of falls because if they fall down, they typically will break a bone very easily. 
if you fall down at 22, you may not break that bone. But if you fall down at 82, you will break that bone. Um, and so osteoporosis results from both that primary aging and the secondary aging, as well as a big one, too little exercise. Remember, exercise, exercise, exercise. It really does protect your health, prevent some of these chronic conditions. And so um, being able to put that weight bearing exercise onto the bones makes them stronger. That's what we want to do here, right? I have a dear couple that are friends of mine and um, you know, they were in their late seventies and one day he was going out to get the trash because you know, every once a week he would put the trash can out in the street, the trash collector would come and pick it up. And then he went out to go roll the trash can back in. And as he went to go roll the trash can back in, he tripped over the curb in the street. He tripped, fell, broke his hip. He died a week later in the hospital. Okay? Because going into the hospital for seniors leads now to infections and lots of different other possibilities for um, detrimental diseases and conditions that can happen to you. All right, the wear and tear theory. So here we're talking about so why do we age? Why do we get older? There's a lot of different theories and some of these things do happen um, and they kind of combine together to cause this aging process. The wear and tear theory says, kind of the more you use something, the more you lose it, right? So just wearing out our body. Who do we see here? I hope many of you know that this is our former President Bush. And um, as we see here, looking at President Bush's face, you see some dark spots on his face. What he has done here is something my father has done, and I know other individuals that have done this, is as we get older, we talked about last time, as we get older, we get age spots or sun spots is what they are. And so as we get older, we see these brown spots pop up on our face. And those brown spots become kind of like primary sites or host for melanoma, skin cancer. Skin cancer is very deadly. And so what we can do is a preventive treatment, which President, former President Bush has done here, which is if you go to the dermatologist, they can actually use kind of a um, liquid nitrogen or they can freeze that spot on your face. They will freeze it and what happens, they, the spot gets darker for about a week and then it literally falls off and you have new skin underneath that spot. And the reason that, um, President, former President Bush is doing that and other people do that is because if we get rid of that spot, then we get rid of the possibility of having melanoma come into that spot. And so that's what we do. We're in tier three. But remember, we don't see those age spots until we get older. But at, for those of you who are in the younger years, you need to protect your skin now. Sunscreen, sunscreen, sunscreen. Right. The genetic clock theory basically says that all of us are predisposed in our genes to how we age and when we age. Cellular aging theory says that, hey, there's lots of different toxins in the environment and stress and all of these put this added kind of pressure onto our cells, which causes them to age. And the telomeres theory basically says that our cells change as we get older. On the positive side here, we have centenarians. Centenarians are individuals who are at least 100 years old. As we see from this gentleman here, pretty rocking, right? 100 years old. Um, when you become a centenarian, as my grandmother, again, she died at 102. So when she turned 100, she actually got a letter from President Obama thanking her for her contributions to society. She had lived through three wars. She had seen the Great Depression. She had been through many different um, historical events in our US history. And so it's just kind of appreciation that you have lived this long. So how can we make sure that we do that? A couple different things we can do. Diet is a big one. Diet is a big one. Vegetables is missing from our diet. As we see here, some of the factors that contribute to long life, Lifelong work and a diet rich in vegetables, right? something that we're not usually doing. Lifelong work, what that means is that research shows it's actually not good for you to retire early and it's not good for you to retire and not have anything to do. So by lifelong work, we mean we want you to volunteer. We want you to go um, pick up the grandkids at school every day and to be doing activities 
So you're contributing to society. Um, cultural factors such as being integrated into a community. So what does that mean? What that means is that as you age, we want you to be connected. Now it could be just with your family. Let's say you have four children and all of the children come, you know, different kids come visit you on different days of the week. Your grandkids come to spend some time on the weekends. You're integrated into your own little family community. Let's say you don't have that situation, but maybe you're part of a place of worship or a faith-based organization and they have a senior group and that group takes trips to Reno and they meet once a month for bingo and they do different activities. That would be being integrated into a community. What we're saying is you need people. Can't be alone. You need people. You need to be connected. In other words, you want somebody to notice if you're missing for three days. Right? You don't want it to be that you know nobody notices whether you haven't connected with anyone for a week or so. So that's what we're talking about. All right. So there's a difference between your maximum life expectancy and average life expectancy. Maximum life expectancy, as we see here, is really the oldest age that um, a mem you know members of a particular species can live. For us as humans, that's 122 years. Now, the average life expectancy is the number of years that the average person is likely to live, okay? And here we have our numbers at 76 for men and 81 for women. So we have a five-year gap here. Why do we think that is? Why is it that women outlive men on average? We've mentioned it before, and I want to make sure you get it into your head that the reason is because women actually have more social networks. In other words, women have more friends. Women talk more. We express our feelings more. Um, when my grandmother was aging, I remember she talked to her sisters, who were all in their 80s, every day, multiple times a day. They were her connection, whereas my grandfather didn't do that. He didn't call guy friends. He didn't have um, his, he didn't call his brothers. You know, they saw each other a couple times a year. And so because of that, in other words, if a woman loses her partner, her male partner, um, she kind of manages. She's got daughters. She's got friends to talk to. She can kind of manage for herself. If a man loses his female partner, if she dies first, research shows there's a great possibility of that a uh, gentleman dying within the next year. Yeah. Um, and so that's what we're going to say. It's so important that you develop social networks. And so lots of reasons or theories on why we get older. We don't know. We don't have like a straight answer. We certainly don't have a way to stop it. Right? If you found the fountain of youth or if you had a pill that cured aging, would you be a multi-billionaire? Because we're trying all that. There's creams and there's procedures and there's all these things going on. Let's cryo-freeze your body. <laughs> there's all these things going on that we want to stay young. And um, I think at this point we should accept that the aging process is a part of development and it's a part or stage or season of life. All right, so make sure to go through your clicker slides and I will see you for next time as we talk about what is going cognitively in the mind as we get into our later years.